we're going to be discussing the reciprocating chiller system and its components. Um, just a basic uh, review of the cycle and what the responsibility of each component is. Now, if we look at this overall picture, the main idea is to cool down this room. Now, this room has an air handler, which an air handler is a coil with a fan. And this is controlled by a thermostat, which is up here. Once you set the thermostat to standard temperature such as 69 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit, this is going to open a valve that's going to allow chilled water to circulate in here. And the fan blows over the coils and allows cold air to come in. While allowing cold air to come in, it is recovering heat that it will take back and dissipate at the chiller system. So to have the basic idea, chilled water is going to be serving as the secondary refrigerant. Uh, the primary refrigerant is going to be only in this chiller. But to discuss it, chilled water comes out at 45 degrees and it's going to come into this room. As it comes in, it's going to blow over with cool air and it's going to pick up heat. And utilizing the 1010 rule, we now have 55 degree water, which increased 10 degrees due to the heat load in the room. Now, as the water is traveling back, to become 45 degrees again, it passes through, well, I, pilot, I apologize, it passes by an expansion tank. This expansion tank is utilized for two items. It allows makeup water to be put back in the system in the event that you have a drain down or a leak. And also inside this expansion tank, you have a diaphragm. And inside this diaphragm, you have what it is, it's called a rubber bladder. And inside, it maintains constant pressure in the event that you have such an increase or decrease in pressure. The diaphragm allows it to maintain a constant pressure so it can work optimally. Now, as it comes through here, it's going to enter what we call the pump suction. Now, this is going to go for both pumps. In this case, over here, as we saw, water comes back and it's going to come through a valve. Now, this valve serves as an isolation valve and it's going to be fully open while in operation. As it comes down, it's met with a strainer. Now this strainer, what it works as, it, it picks up any slag from the pipe, any, any impurities, any garbage inside the, inside the piping. Um, you know, a lot of times it's cooling tower fill and slag from the pipe. And to prevent it from getting circulated through the system and possibly damaging the pump inside, the balloon inside of the pump, it's going to come in and it's going to pick up all in the strainer. And as it picks up in the strainer, eventually this is going to get clogged, which is why strainers always have to be cleaned out during seasonal startup or during proper HVAC maintenance. Now, as the water comes through, it goes through the strainer and it's going to come into your casing, which will be inside here. As water comes in, you follow my mouse, it's going to come in through the eye of the impeller. And as it comes in through the eye of the impeller, going to come in and as the impeller is moving, circulating, it gets discharged where it comes out to the other side, which is known as the discharge line. Now before it goes out to the discharge line, you have in this case two items here. One of them is called a petcock valve, which is also known as a vent valve. So when you're doing seasonal startup, if you have air inside this balloon, you're going to have a cavitated pump which will not circulate the water properly will not allow you to circulate chilled water throughout the entire system. So before startup, you want to open this valve and bleed out all the air. And once bled out, you just keep it shut. Meanwhile, down here, you have something called a cyclone separator. Uh, it's also been known as a venturi. It's more clear in the condensed water pump picture. This is utilized to make sure that you have clean water that goes through a strainer inside here. Clean water comes and cools your mechanical seals which a lot of time are made of a ceramic interior. And if you have any sediment to even scratch it, will cause mechanical seals to start leaking and not operate properly. Outside here, you have bearings. And these bearings go through a shaft that goes through the impeller and then go into the motor, which we'll see clearly in the condensed water pump. Of course, you have to keep these bearings lubricated to allow proper rotation of the shaft, uh, which allows the pump to operate optimally. Now returning, after it goes through the pump, it's going to come out, it's going to go through a check valve. The check valve pretty much allows water to circulate to one side, 
but it does not allow it to flow back. This is a, serves as a warranty to assure that in the event that you have an issue, you don't have water coming back and circulating and damaging your pump itself. After that, you go through another isolation valve, which is then sent into the evaporator of the chiller. Now, as we know, to do maintenance, you will have to properly shut off this pump, which will come here to the power panel. And you're going to want to shut the starter off. This is for both simulator and real life. And then after that, you're going to want to shut this disconnect switch and then perform a lockout tagout procedure, which is mandatory. After that, you shut these isolation valves and you can clean the strainer, check the pump seals, no problem. You'll have no issues whatsoever to perform any maintenance. Damage check valve, replacing of the gauges, even though they should have valves under them. So now that we've cleared the chilled water pumps, the water, remember this water is still 55 degrees and we want to bring it down to 45, is going to come into the chiller system. Specifically, it's going to go into the evaporator. So this water is going to come in at 55 degrees. And what it is, it goes through coils. And as it goes through the coils, in the shell, outside of the coils, you have refrigerant. Now as this water comes through this chiller barrel, this evaporator barrel, it's going to give its heat up and be picked up by the refrigerant inside the chiller system. Now the, the refrigerant inside the chiller system is going to be a low pressure, low temperature liquid. And as it picks up the heat from this 55 degree chilled water, it's going to turn into a low pressure, low temperature, superheated vapor. Now, we'll come back to this system. Although over here now, the chilled water is going to come out at 45 degrees. It's going to come out and it's going to circulate right back into the air handler system. Now we can see how the chilled water system operates now. Now, if we come back over here to the condenser water system, we now know this error. So now let's discuss. We took heat from this room, brought it, increased its pressure, and the heat got picked up at the evaporator. Now, at the evaporator, it got compressed at the compressor, right? and then it went down to the condenser where it got condensed. And that's when afterwards it goes through your metering device and then back into your evaporator, which we'll discuss. Now over here on the high side of your system, let's discuss the heat that we took from this room. Now, over here on the condenser water pump, the idea is we're taking heat that came from the condenser. Now, let's say that we have 75 degree water coming in and we have 85 to 90 degree water coming out. The reason being is because this 75 degree water that comes from this cooling tower comes down, picks up the heat at the condenser, and now it comes back out. It's going to come back out at 85, 90 degrees, right? This heat, we're going to bring it all the way up to the roof of the building and into your cooling tower. Now in your cooling tower, you got your water returning from the condenser up here, and it's going to go on the top of your fill. Now you have your fan circulating, right? And what the fan doing is it's bringing air, outside air, through the fill. And as it brings it through the fill, this air is picking up all the heat that this water picked up from the condenser. And as it picked up all the heat, it is going up and evaporates, and it gets discharged at the top of this tower. This is why in New York City and in other cities throughout the United States and the world, you're going to see these cooling towers on the roofs and in the winter they're going to seem to have a white smoke. The white is just the reason because of the temperature difference, but nonetheless that is heat from inside the building being brought out. Now, as it comes down the fill, it's going to come down in droplets, just like the mouse is going down. See, it comes down through this fill, and it comes out and collects at the bottom. By the time it hits the bottom, it's going to be 75 degrees or whichever set point you put. And the way the set point is controlled is by the fan. When it powers on, when it powers off, or when the VFD ramps it to a certain speed slash hertz. Now, as this water is coming down, you also have a makeup water line, which is to make up any water. It could be due to a high load, high temperatures. You also have an overfill line, which let's say where this mouse is, the water line is here. If it increases here, 
to prevent it from starting to overflow all over the cooling tower, this is going to lead to a drain. And you have a drain line that's closed when the cooling tower is operating. This is going to be used, for example, if you have a seasonal chiller plant, you're going to open this and drain the cooling tower completely for the winter. So now that your cold water is collected, you want to go back to the condenser and pick up more heat. So you're going to come back down. As you can see here, come back down. You're going to go once again through your pump suction. No different than the chilled water. It's a different layout. You're going to go in through your valve, pass your valve through your strainer. It's going to go into the impeller, increase in pressure, come out, go through your check valve, pass your isolation valve, and it's going to go back into your condenser. Now, if we see over here, this is the volute that houses the impeller of the pump. As we discussed, this is your mechanical seals. All right. And the mechanical seals are being cooled by what we discussed. And here it's called the Venturi. Now in here, you'll see water comes up, gets collected in the strainer, and then it's divided into these two areas, where clean water with no sediment cools the mechanical seals, as we discussed. Meanwhile, over here, and on this side over here, you have your bearings. These bearings are to be lubricated and allow the shaft to rotate without interruption, to rotate perfectly and allowing the impeller to spin along in, in sync with the motor. This is the motor. Perfect. So now that you see what's going on here, you have chilled water coming out at 45, picking up heat and going back to the chiller. And after that, as the refrigeration process goes, you have condenser water coming in at 75 degrees, picking up the heat and dissipating it outside. Ultimately, just like the definition of refrigeration, it's refrigeration is taking heat from a place where it is not wanted and transferring it, see, transferring it to a place where it is unobjectionable or not desired outside. All right, let's discuss your reciprocating chiller. All right, so in your reciprocating chiller, you have the basic components of refrigeration, compressor, evaporator, metering device, and condenser. Now, just as we discussed, let's discuss, you have chilled water coming in, and as you have chilled water coming in, the liquid refrigerant that we discussed, low pressure, low temperature, picks up the heat, and it, and it evaporates into a vapor, low pressure, low temperature, superheated vapor. Now, once in a vapor, it's going to come out as a vapor and go into your suction line. Now, utilizing this compressor, you have low pressure, low temperature, superheated vapor coming in, and it goes into your compressor. Now, here you're going to have a charging valve, a transducer, which is sending a signal of a pressure sensor to the computer, and you have your service valve. Now, for those of you who've seen this on the RMO written questions, it's going to come in, as I say, through the back end of the compressor, which is the motor. And the reason this suction vapor goes through the motor first is to cool the motor windings. So this works perfectly. You got vapor, cold vapor refrigerant coming in, cooling the motor windings, and that's when it goes into your pistons. Now, as it goes through your pistons, it gets compressed into a high temperature, high pressure, superheated vapor come over here to, we have an unloader and what this unloader does is it reduces the compressive capacity by holding a suction valve open now in the event that you have for example a satisfied load in a room and you don't need such 45 degree water to be circulated through there can be done is this system unloads allowing it to hold the suction service valve open allowing compressor the compressor not to compress the vapor in this piston right this will allow the refrigeration system to work without any interruptions but not cooling such a load that way you don't have a low load condition or it doesn't get too cold in the room okay. right. meanwhile as it gets compressed it was now going to be transferred over here where you have your discharge service valve your discharge or high side transducer your charging valve and of course, now you have high pressure, high temperature, superheated vapor coming out. Now, as it comes out, it's going to go to the back into the condenser, which we're going to discuss right now before we review oil. 
Now, these systems utilize oil for lubrications of the pistons inside the compressor. So you see here, you have a oil pressure transducer, which sends the oil pressure to the control panel. You have a sight glass, which according to the screen is proper. You're going to have two, one diagonally above the other. And one should always be full. The bottom one should always be full with the top one always halfway. You have an oil service valve to charge or to drain. All right. Over here, you have the plate that covers the oil pump. You have a crankcase breather, which carries refrigerant vapor out of the crankcase when the heater turns on. Now remember, when this shuts off, you may have liquid refrigerant missing, mixing with the oil. Now this crankcase breather allows when you turn your oil on prior to starting your chiller, you have to have the oil on to be heated so it can allow proper lubrication of the interior of the compressor. As it's heating, this heat's going to easily vaporize the refrigerant, which allows it to come in through the crankcase breather and back into the system. You have your heater, of course, which during the off cycle separates oil from refrigerant, as we discussed. And we discussed these items as well. So now, let's move on to the back of the refrigerant chiller. So, if you can see this line over here through my mouse cursor, it comes over here. And it comes into your condenser now much like the system over here you have the condent the refrigerants in the shell and inside the tubes that flow back and forth you have your condenser water so now as you can see your condenser water comes in goes through a strainer comes in picks up all the heat from the refrigerant now as it picks up the heat from the refrigerant as we recall this is a high temperature high pressure superheated vapor now as this water comes in at 75 degrees, it comes out 85, 90 degrees. <clears throat> you now have high temperature, high pressure, subcooled liquid. Now this vapor has been condensed to a liquid. Now all we need to do is drop the pressure of this so we can repeat this cycle. So your refrigerant is condensed and subcooled and it leads us over here. All right. This liquid is going to come in through a filter dryer. It's going to clean out any impurities from the system right before it comes through the filter dryer it goes through a king valve which is also a service valve the service valve is to charge liquid refrigerant and manually pump down the circuit once you pump down this circuit this means that if you shut this valve you're not going to have refrigerant flowing through your metering device into your evaporator which is going to decrease significantly the pressure inside your evaporator and the machine will shut off in a low pressure cutout which is also a safety shut off so, as the subcool liquid comes through your king valve, which will be fully open, it's going to go through your filter dryer, removes moisture particles and acid from the refrigerant. Afterwards, it goes through your solenoid, which is an electric valve, an automatic valve, can be normally open or normally closed. This, in the same sense as the king valve, can also pump down the circuit, with the exception that you don't have to touch this valve. This just shuts on its own through the control panel, and it'll pump down the circuit. After it gets out of the circuit, you come out and you come over here to your liquid line where you see your sight glass. The sight glass will always come with the label on the, around the outer edge. It's going to explain to you how this, what should be in the system. It has different color codes in case you have a problem in the system. And it's very helpful to see, identify visually any issues. And afterwards, you come to your thermostatic expansion valve. Now, the thermostatic expansion valve, in this case, it operates with a sensing bulb that is connected over in your suction line. This sensing bulb is the opening force and it measures the superheat in your suction line. And, al and this allows it to open enough so you can maintain between 8 to 12 degrees superheat, which is standard. Now, as this sensing bulb is opening, you also have on the bottom a manual spring. Now, this manual spring is factory adjusted. You can adjust it. A lot of people say don't touch it there are methods to doing it not just opening it so you have the opening force and you have the closing force and sometimes you will also have an external equalizer which is not shown on this so I will not get into that so. that is how the system operates 
we discuss the components all right if you have any questions please throw in a comment i'll be more than happy to help and i hope this was helpful in some way to also to include before i end this lesson over here we saw this this is a pressure relief valve for the condenser this is a safety if the high pressure cutout switch which is for an increase in pressure shuts off on a safety if that were never to work this relief valve would open and allow the refrigerant to come out before it causes damage and ruptures the barrel all right as we come over here this is the main disconnect for the chiller and this is the control panel where you would get your readings Apologies, and also to remember, we'll discuss this on the next class.